Joseph Williams, uh, I met at in Montreal at RLDM, and uh, I told him about um, about Amy at tea time, and he thought it was cool. And I think uh, he's he's dropped in on hang out with us before today. He wanted to to uh, give a talk of his own, and so isn't this cool that we have like you know uh, Montreal and Toronto and Edmonton, and now we're getting. Uh, talks across these centers and uh, and interchange. I think I, I think it's cool. Now the the bad news is you know there was some miscommunication. Uh, Joseph was thinking he might talk for like an hour or two hours, <laughs> but I, I hope that's been corrected. And he's told me only only really only an hour to talk for twenty minutes. Uh, good, good. And, um, yes, um, what it means is I took my hour long talk and I put it in 15 minutes. Oh, that's, that sounds like a really good solution. But so, uh, I don't know, Fernando remembers some of the details. Uh, Joseph's at uh, in Toronto. And are you part of the vector? I, I just moved last year, so I'm actually, I applied to Vector for you this year. I'm a professor in human computer interaction, so I applied back this in RL, but I just moved here, so I'm now kind of figuring out the relationship with Vector. Yeah, anyway, I think we should all give them a big welcome at this cross-site cross talk. Thank you. For sure. Ooh. Yeah, thanks everyone. And if you look on the screen now, there's this Google Doc. I said to link out, but if you go to tiny.cc U of A, you can actually just like pop in here and like add questions. A lot of people already like we wrote out who they are and what they do because this is a good way of like meeting you all, even if I'm not actually there. Um, and Fernando, I think you had some ground rules for like people can just jump in and ask questions or should they walk up to the front of the room? What were you thinking? So uh, if you have a question during the talk, maybe raise your hand and come to the front. Uh, as fast as you can, and then just ask your question here in front of Joseph so that he can see you. Uh, maybe just in front of here, and I'm just going to turn on, turn over the computer. Yeah, I don't think you have to turn around. As long as someone's near enough to yell, then that's enough. They should just be like within two meters of the laptop and they can yell a bit. That would be perfect. Yeah, perfect. perfect. So if you have a question, just wave and come to the front uh, and ask your question. And I'll interrupt jo Joseph so that you, you have the time. Uh, so yeah, I think we're ready now. Yeah, and I guess one thing I should say too is it's pretty hard to like do one of these remote presentations. Um, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me at any point. Just say Joseph, and I'll pause, and then you can ask a question. Um, I should also say that um, I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. So that's why I have this weird accent. And I have to tell everyone that because if I don't say it before the talk, they say they missed the introduction trying to guess where I'm from. <laughs> so now you all know I know I have your full attention. But it does mean that I sound like I'm speaking twice as fast as normal, mm -hmm. and I already speak twice as fast as, as a normal person, so it sounds like a four times speed. <laughs> so for that, at any point, just say Joseph. Um, say that again, Joseph, slow down. That's like a good um, cue for me. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think I should just give you the, um, the, the crux of this talk right now. Um, I'm telling you about my research, but really and truly, in the future, you should think of me if you want to apply like algorithms to bandits, algorithms for defense of RL problems to a real world setting where we're actually going to help people, then that's the kind of time to talk to us. So we built a ton of systems where you can run talks and sampling for choosing which explanations people get in an online course. You can apply like you know different kinds of algorithms to figure out which messages do we send people to get them to exercise more. These are the kind of things that like my team deploys right now in real world settings. Like we work with Good Life. We're text messaging people to get them to go to the gym. And we're analyzing that data real time to figure out which messages help different people. So that's kind of what you can think of us. You know, that's what a lot of our work is about. So if that's of interest to you, um, then feel free to reach out at any point. Yeah, so I would say that um, you know, the title of this talk is combining active learning, I'm using that broadly, like find bandits, find RL, and human computation for A-B testing. Perpetually enhancing and personalizing user interfaces. And I think, as I mentioned before, there's this Google Doc here, tiny.ccu So you can pop that open right now and like, write any information about who you are or ask any questions throughout the talk. I'll check it out at the end. So let me just give you an example of a problem I might be tackling. How do we do a dynamic EV test to enhance or personalize email? For example, if we're sending people emails in a course, 
and we want to get them to respond about how things are going. How do we A-B test? Randomize people to get version A or B or C, or do a randomized experiment? Which of these subject lines is going to get them to reply? Which of these messages is actually going to get them to open up the email and see what they're thinking? And so I would thought, you can see very naturally how you form it. This is a, as an RL problem, right? Or this is a banded problem. Which of these actions is optimal? Which subject line? Is it returning to course? Or is it, please answer my email, I'm desperate. <laughs> Which of these is going to lead to the highest response rate? And so what I try to do is figure out, how can we do these A-B tests in real time? So that while we're running the A-B test, after 20 people give an answer, we have entered data, and we change what happens to the next person. Does that make sense? And of course, you've got your action space, right? Like different subject lines, intro messages, but you've also got context. How old is someone? How many years have they been active? What country they're from? So I just want to give you one concrete example of the kind of problem we tackle. But broadly, our vision is to say, I think we can take any user interface, whether it's an email or a text message or an online course, and make this a perpetual, intelligently improving system. And the way we do that is by applying algorithms from, like banded or RL algorithms. For example, the vision I would have here is that we have a system that keeps improving like a RL teacher does. To be concrete, if you're doing an online course and someone gives you an explanation for how to solve a problem, it's kind of weird that I give you the same explanation over and over again. What a real teacher would do is every time they explain a concept, they've explained it in different ways. And I will allow them to discover which explanations people find helpful. But also it helps them discover other first lines. For example, are there low knowledge students who find simple explanations helpful? And high knowledge students who find complex ones useful? So we want to build systems that are like this. They keep on testing out new ideas and improving automatically. And so my main approach has been applying banded algorithms, but I'm really open to RL more generally. That's just not something that I've focused on as much, but you all are the experts in that. So how can we apply bandits and RL to A-B testing? So my approach in general is to say, if we want to build intelligent user interfaces, if we want to take online courses and make them like a smart system, we have to reimagine how we do A-B testing. So I tackle HCI and human computer interaction this way, education help. Whenever I have a problem, I think to myself, how do I design an A-B test, and how do I figure out how I want to measure success? And that's where I draw on theories from cognitive science, an area I published it. But I think you also have to work with domain experts. So we also work often with instructors in courses, or maybe people who, who are doctors who send text messages to get people to exercise. So we do collaborative design of these A-B tests. Then we deploy them, and that's where we bring in dynamic analysis. Instead of just randomizing people 50-50, we want to change the probability that they're getting an action in proportion to the evidence that that's the best action. And so I think that's clear to all our people here, right? That can leave over time to enhancement where you give someone like the best text message or personalization where one subgroup might get message B and one subgroup gets message A. So now you have to do things like discover who the clusters of people I should be personalizing to. And so in my PhD, I applied Bayesian statistics and machine learning to modeling cognitive science. So I worked with Tanya Rebozo and also Tom Griffith, so I think a lot of you know. But now what I do is actually apply this more directly to HCI, where we're building systems and we're applying these algorithms in real time. So this seems pretty promising, right? We can take any railroad system and do A-B testing and apply RL. But something's missing from this, right? If it was really an intelligent system, it would be able to add new actions. So we also want to keep adding new conditions, new options, while we're doing a study. And this is where I draw on work on crowdsourcing and human computation. How do you bring human beings into the loop with RL so that you keep adding new options while the study's running? So if you wanted to do all this now, you probably could have. <laughs> like if I, when I first ran studies in Khan Academy, we could hardly do any testing. We definitely couldn't do like dynamic improvements or plug-in RL. So we've actually got this specification, we call it the MOOCLEN web service. And the key thing is if you want to upload your algorithms and run them in a real course or run them with like good life, this is basically what we use to facilitate this. I'm just looking at my time. So to give you an overview, I'm not going to touch on all these things. So I basically try to remove um, parts of my talk and just replace them with a screenshot of the paper so you can read up more on it if you're interested. This is like a survey. If you see something and say, you know, we really want you to come back for another tea talk, then I can do it on one of these topics. So I've kind of outlined this vision of perpetually improving interfaces for people. 
and said, what we need to do is reimagine how we do A-B testing. So I'm going to present in detail one study where we built a system that would crowdsource explanations from students, and then we use talks and sampling to figure out which explanations were highly rated. So this system ended up giving explanations that were as good as those from a real instructor. Then in about a minute each, I'm going to talk about how we've actually deployed this system in real courses at Harvard, where instructors actually would A-B test which explanations students found helpful, and so we use talks and sampling to figure out which were best. And then I want to give you an example of what we want to do in the future, which is apply banded algorithms to discovering how to personalize. So in this first study, crowdsourcing explanations from students. We call this the adaptive explanation improvement system. And the key idea here is that we give people explanations. And then we want to improve these over time. What we actually do is we tell students, after they read an explanation, explain your own words why the answer is correct. And then this allows us to keep generating new explanations. But to make sure these are actually good, we tend to analyze this data and see which explanations are highly rated. So in this, if you were a participant in this study, you would see an online problem, and you'd attempt it and be eventually told the correct answer. Then we give you an explanation for why the answer is correct. And, we, and this is what we're A-B testing. We ask you a rating. For example, how helpful was this information for your learning? From zero, completely unhelpful, to ten. Perfectly helpful. We then tell you to help you learn, explain in your own words why the answer is correct. And you see why this is kind of sneaky, right? If the explanation is longer than 50 characters, and you see it's useful for other people, then we add it to our pool. So we basically have a way of using crowdsourcing to add actions while we're running a study. Now, of course, how do you know if these are any good? And these are pretty rudimentary slides because they're from a, a talk to a HDI audience on an RL1, so it's probably more redundant than you need. But you basically model this as a banded problem. There's a set of actions, which are the explanations. The reward function is people's rating of how helpful they are, from 0 to 10. And of course, what policy do we use, or what policy do we algorithm? In this case, we're going to use Thompson sampling. I know there are lots of ways we can approach this, but if you want to do a real deployment, like actual students, with instructors and with behavioral scientists, having something that's randomized is extremely important. Because all of A-B testing are based on randomization. You already ask them to do something crazy, right? You're telling them, don't randomize equally, don't randomize uniformly, change your probability while you're in a study. This is already something that's pretty novel. Asking them to just try UCB or something else is a bit of a non-starter for a lot of people. But we can argue with that date, especially if travel's there. So basically we're using Thompson sampling, and the idea is of course we have a probability distribution over explanations. We use a really simple model here, and we can talk more about better ways to do it. Basically we assume that the probability in explanation being rated helpful falls at beta distribution. And we use the priors as 19 and 1. So what we're saying is before you see any data, imagine that every explanation has been given a rating of 9 and a rating of 10. Then, of course, we assume that the ratings themselves follow by normal distribution with 10 draws, and the probability of success is drawn from that beta. So intuitively, if I give you a rating of 8, if you give me a rating of 8, it's like I give you 8 thumbs up and 2 thumbs down. 8 successes, 2 failures. And so, based, so we deploy this, and we're essentially, over time, updating this distribution. So when we deploy this, we deploy this with 150 people on Amazon Mechanical Turk. And at first, there's no explanations. Eventually, there might be one that a student writes out, and it gets added to the pool. Eventually, you have two and then we're doing A-B testing. But as people are rating explanations higher, and we're running top stuff in this beta binomial distribution, we eventually start to get some distribution. And so what you end up with at the end is a probability distribution over the explanations. So this seems that we can actually learn higher rates of explanations. But do these actually help learning? So to do this, we did a separate study. What we did is we took the explanations from the system, 
and we compare them to other conditions. We looked at just the original problems with no explanations and compared that to the problems with explanations from the system. So access the adaptive explanation improvement system where we crowdsource them and then use some of the sampling to choose higher rate explanations. We also compared this to problems that had explanations that were filtered out because Thompson sampling gave them less than 5% probability. Finally, we had the instructor write an explanation. So what is this showing? On the vertical axis, you have the increase in accuracy. So again, we give people a test for some algebra problems, and then we give them the original problems, and then we give them another test. So the accuracy increase says, how much should they increase their learning from pre to post? And what you can see here is that the increase in learning is higher if you get explanations from the system. Even though the explanations were crowdsourced, once you apply it onto sampling, you identify explanations that can help learning measurably. Now, of course, I'm sure there's some skeptics who are saying, well, of, of course an explanation helps learning more than none, right? If you give them any explanation, they will help learning. So what do these skeptics say to that? <laughs> if we give explanations that Thompson sampling assigned less than 5% probability to, it's like giving nothing at all. It just doesn't help learning. So the final thought is, how good would this system have to be compared to that of a real instructor to be useful? Like, would it have to be 50% as good or 50% as good? Actually, there isn't a significant difference. So, whether you crowdsource explanations and run into terms of sampling, or whether the instructor takes a long time to write one themselves, they're equally beneficial for learning. So that first illustration was about how we can actually apply it by now, we're talking about something to the setting. Joseph, yeah. we have a question. Great. Hey, hey Joseph, um, this was 150 students. Yes. Were they done sequentially or in parallel? Sequentially. So you learn on one before you go to the next one. Exactly. Huh. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of necessary. So a lot of what we do is try to find scenarios where you can actually apply these algorithms because a lot of the time you can't, right? For example, if you were to A-B test um, what my lecture is, that's not helpful because you have to take everyone at the same time. So you're right, that's an important feature of the situation. Yeah, so the second line of work, which I'm just going to point to really briefly, is what we call instructor sense experimentation. So the idea here is that um, we actually took the exact same system and we let instructors use it to A-B test which explanations they give to their students. And so imagine an algorithm, you want to actually apply RL to improving the quizzes you give people. Well, then you could actually use our system to deploy it to students, for example, giving them quantitative explanations versus analogical. And again, based on ratings, as you can see, the system could learn which explanations are higher rated. And so there's more details in this paper at uh, Kai. But I would say the long and short of it is instructors were really excited for the fact that this research was actually helping their students. They said, this is a way that A-B testing can actually improve instruction. What one student says can help with the next. And so they felt that fine balance in the setting meant that A-B tests were a lot more practical for them. Now, one thing that we're working on a lot now is basically, suppose you change A-B testing and you're re-rating randomization with Thompson sampling. Well, how do you analyze data like this? There's a whole literature of hypothesis testing and statistics, and now, like, education researchers, psychology researchers, medical researchers are saying to us, well, Joseph, that sounds nice, but how on earth do I analyze this data? And so this is a big focus of our work now. Um, that's a paper, a journal of educational data mining, about some of the issues that come up when you're adapting randomization. And what we're doing now with several biased statisticians is thinking about how to either modify Thompson sampling to reduce these issues, or modify the way we do hypothesis testing, or the way we estimate confidence in the first after the fact. So the third line of work is really outlining the future. So we're excited for using EV testing to discover how to personalize. So not just which explanations are best on average, but are there subgroups of students 
who had special for the best for. And just to illustrate, here's one study we ran. We sent students emails and trying to get them to give input about the course. So we might have a brief message, so this is one that mentions the fact that they've been absent from the course. And so what you're seeing here on the first class is, is response rate based on the brief versus mentioned absence. So what are we finding? Well, it looks like there's no effect, right? So you might as well give up and go home. Actually, if you break this up by students who are low activity, in that they haven't spent many days in the course, versus those who are high activity, what you see is a trend that the brief message might lead to high response rates for low activity people. Maybe because they're actually like to read something that doesn't require a lot of effort. But the mention absence one needs to high responses from the high activity people. Maybe because they want to explain why they haven't been active recently. Or they have to justify why they're not engaged. So what's kind of nice here is that if we had optimized by delivering brief messages to low activity, mention absence to high activity, we could have actually increased responses by about 14.5%. So we can again enhance the experience of people, not by changing our actions, but by figuring out which actions are effective to deliver to different people. And of course, many of you are starting to think about how we apply contextual parameters in this kind of setting. Again, as Rich said, this is a sequential setting where someone comes in and gets an email, and then they disappear, we never see them again. Then someone else comes in and they get an email, then they disappear. So that's pretty well modeled by a bandit, because the observations, the people are independent. On the other hand, what could also be really interesting is, for example, if you have the same person and you're sending emails to them, how do you sequence those actions? Or how do you get that person to change their state of mind? How do you get them motivated so that later actions are more effective? And that's a more challenging setting, but that's one way a really interesting collaborating people. A lot of Ami and Masood Faraman and I have been chatting about that a bit. Again, what we're exploring now is much higher dimensional approaches. So if you think about emails, not just A versus B, but an action space where there are three subject lines, three intro messages, three response formats. And you have this huge list of context variables or state variables. And there are all kinds of issues here. For example, we know that most of these won't have any effect. So how do we do some kind of regularization where we can actually do some variable selection, where we can eliminate certain terms we're considering? That's like the big challenge we're facing now. And especially when we're running many actions at once, how often can we assume they're independent? If we can assume independence, then it's a lot more efficient with the data. But if we can't, if we do, then we might miss out on some interesting structure. So being able to have algorithms that help us do discovery in real time while we're running a study with very sparse data is a big challenge right now that we're thinking about. This is just a first step, like a recent post on um, education data mining, but we're now kind of thinking about characterizing through simulations and other work, what kinds of, when a contextual band is helpful versus not. How much do you lose by using a band versus a contextual band? Great, so I think um, I'm actually not too bad on time, which is good, so I'll wrap in a couple minutes. So I started this vision of professionally improving user interfaces. And so the approach is we have to reimagine any testing, so it's collaborative, it's dynamic, personalized, by applying algorithms like BAM and Scenario. I gave you one example of a system that would crowdsource explanations from students and dynamically identify which ones are higher rated using Thompson sampling. And this identified explanations would help learning as much as those of a real instructor. I gave one example of, again, how we're using Thompson sampling for bandits to help instructors do AV tests in their course in ways that they find are more practical and benefit students immediately. But this raises a lot of issues. When we apply these algorithms to the re-rating randomization, how do we analyze this data from a statistical, a statistical perspective? How do we draw inferences about what the means are, do hypothesis tests, have reasonable confidence intervals? And all these questions just blow up once you start talking about discovering how to personalize. So I gave an example of that email study, but more broadly, it really blows up the exploration exploitation trade-off when you've got to be discovering and exploring what might work for subgroups of people. And so in the, in terms of the future, one example of something I'm working on now is with good life, sending text messages to people to get them to exercise more. 
And so this is a really nice complex action space where we have a lot of actions, they can be packed in different ways. And we have, lot, we have a lot of data about people. For example, did they go to the gym last week? When did they go to the gym? What's their pattern of behavior? Are they feeling motivated or not? And we've actually got the data from Good Life flowing back in real time, but we can actually see if they go to the gym or not. This can be a really nice setting to apply full RL because we've got one person for 30 days. What's the sequence of actions we give to them to try and motivate them? I just listed some examples of potential research direction, but I can kind of come back to these later. But more generally, for human competition, interactive ML, people in the loop. How do we integrate people with algorithms so they decide when to add new actions? When should we ask someone to add new text message to motivate people? How do we encode people's prior knowledge? When do they help us figure out which data points are relevant or not? Are we going to allow people like instructors to set the exploration and exploitation trade-off based on their particular scenario? You can think about interpretable R more generally. And another example of something we constantly run up against is that we don't often know the reward function that we really care about. Like we're sending messages to people, right? To get them to go to the gym. And you could look at something like whether they go to the gym or not. But that's just too sparse. What we're going to do now is probably have them rate messages and optimize for that. But that's not really exactly what we care about because people could be wrong in their ratings. So it's really challenging to think about how do you do some kind of exploitation here while you know the fact that your reward function is something that may not be accurate or that someone may come in a month and tell you, actually, we don't care about that anymore. You should optimize this other thing. And just in terms of like what's going on in general, just to let people know, um, if you're interested in deploying bandwidth RL to relevant settings, for example, if you've done a bunch of nice theory work and you want a good application to put into a paper, or if grad students are going to the job market, they want something like towards the end of their talk in a different direction, here's how I'm going to use this to change the way people learn in education. Here's how I'm going to make people healthier. This might be a good setting where we can chat. Um, I also actually have my weekly, my research group is online every week actually. So if you email me or look at that URL, I've got a mailing list, anyone can sign up for it. And it's kind of like drop in. If you see a talk that's relevant to you, feel free to show up and listen in. Or honestly, if some of you want to present your work, like if you have like a, you're preparing for a conference, you want a rough talk, you want to just present and get some, get some feedback, just feel free to email me. We have people Skyping for like a 20 minute talk. Um, as I mentioned, I've got this web service where you can plug in RL algorithms and bandwidth to relevant settings. So my usage program is Sam's the one who handles that. And right now I have an active grant. It's um, called Personalizing Explanations in Online Problems Using Contextual Bandits. So it's a thing I funded for for the next two years by ONR from the US. And so we do a lot of work on that topic. So if it's at all of interest to you, feel free to reach out. Or if you don't mind, just just ask some questions sometimes. It's always interesting getting people's input on the work we're doing. All right, well, thanks so much. Well, I just have a uh, sort of terminological question as always. Uh, when do we call something A-B testing and when do we call it, it uh, a bandit problem? Because I would have thought that A-B testing inherently meant that, that it was not uh, sequential. That's what I would have thought just as a term. Yeah, um, well, so sorry, I think I'm going to repeat your question back. So when we call it A-B testing versus a bandit problem, um, are you kind of saying to me that if it's A-B testing, it sounds like people are not adapting or changing over time. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, you're actually totally right. So basically, yeah, when I say A-B test, all I mean is we're randomizing people. So the word I use actually like a dynamic A-B test. So when I say dynamic EV test, I mean we're changing, we're changing our assignments rule over time. And that's something that you, you could probably model as a bandit problem. But you know, it could also be that you model this as, as full RL. So a lot of the work I do over last right course to what, what Susan Murphy is doing, right? So you could also think that I'm sending you a text message, like, go to the gym now is message A. Message B is stop being lazy, get up. But maybe if I send you stop being lazy on, on day one, on day two, you're really receptive to the message, go to the gym now. So that's again what I would say is dynamic AB testing, where we're always randomizing because we're exploring, but we're still trying to do some kind of exploitation along the way. Or some kind of sequential structure where we think if we send you a message earlier, it makes you more amenable to one in the future. Good. Okay, someone else should exercise 
and walking up to ask a question. You have to be really brave now, come on. <laughs> So I guess just some to sort of prompt some questions like what what was clear what was interesting right what I presented or, or what was clear like could you all see ways to like apply methods that you use here are you skeptical about the kinds of methods we're using do you think for example that um these like what, what, I'm, I'm interested in what the, what the feature, like here's a question someone could ask, which is um, what are the computational features of these problems? Like what tend to be issues we run into? Are these problems where we have a lot of data, very little data, where we have tons of options, very few options? If you're interested, I can speak more to that question if it's helpful. Yeah, so you might have lots, be able to get lots and lots of data running online on the internet. Now, of course, not everything is going to be sequential. Like, if you're trying to do it in parallel with lots of things on the internet, you know, some things, like you'd be interacting with maybe thousands of people at once. And so you will be kind of not quite sequential, with not, not also, also not quite, um, uh, I don't know, batch. You could do it, what do they, what do they call it? There's a name for that. Have, uh, they're like uh, <coughs> you. So you mean, so for example, um, you're running many experiments at once, but you can't always use data from one to influence what happens next. Yeah. If you're really running it at scale. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily have it ever, have each one completed before the next one is generated. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely true. That often happens. And then if you went to a sequential case, then you really uh, would have, uh, you'd be in the middle of many different sort of episodes. Each person would be an episode. Be an yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's something, that's definitely true. I think one thing that's interesting that, you know, Susan has been interested in is when you have a bunch of people, like, let's say you have 100 people, and you have 50 observations from each of them, when should you treat people as their own unique flower, snowflake, This is when you're pooling across them? And that's an issue that kind of comes up. Um, what about using this for MOOCs? I would think that would yep. be a big use case. Yeah, that's where a lot of these things I deploy are in MOOCs. So I was so I guess actually I realized I'd actually give an intro to myself now that I think about it. So <laughs> basically I you know I did my undergrad at U of T and then I, I did my PhD at UC Berkeley with Tom Griffiths and Tyler and Brozo, like by machine learning um, to monic to psychology. And then at Stanford I was in the office of the book there, so then I did more on indication research. And then Harvard I was also in their um, office for an education, and that's why I did a lot more human interaction. And so then I was in Singapore for a year. Um, as a assistant professor, and then I moved to Toronto. And so what I would say is a lot of my work basically tries to combine like online education, um, health as an application, with cognitive science and human interaction and reinforcement learning. When I say reinforcement learning, it's the most advanced for now. You all are the RL experts. <laughs> but yeah, I think these are all great settings to, uh, to apply these to. And you know, if, if I were to share a bit on the kinds of problems you face here that we're facing, it's really about data efficiency. Like I think Emma Brunskill has some work on this topic. How do you learn as quickly as possible when you've got like hundreds of observations, maybe thousands? You don't have millions. Okay. Uh, I think we have another question coming up. Great. Hi, thanks for the talk. And it, is, it sounds like a, an interesting idea to try to automate some of this, you know, how to give people explanations um, that will, you know, automatically without having the person involved. But like any sort of a, I mean, this reminds me of recommender systems, those sorts of things. Yeah. Depending upon the day, the individual person, this is based on like, a sample of one myself, it's very different, the responses, the types of things I want. Get these recommender systems saying, if I like this once, I'm always going to like this thing. So I'm wondering, you know, this is a general problem, these sorts of things. Maybe I'm exceptional in that way, and that most people always prefer the same thing. Or maybe uh -huh. most people are all over the place, so that it's going to be really hard to automate this, and I don't know, because I don't work on this, but maybe you can tell me. 
No, what you said is a great point. Um, basically, that's kind of a power debate formulation, right? It's you're trying to optimize the best action, but just like you said, maybe I really like actually getting the explanation of simple, but I just get fed up a bit off time. So I think that's a great example of a problem we're trying to tackle, which is um, how do we how do we solve this computationally? How should we model the fact that we're not just trying to optimize for what's best for a particular person? We also need some notion of drift or non-stationarity. The person may get fed up of what's being presented. Or maybe the person, like, if it, if it seems presented really often, they like it even more. So how should we capture that? Like, are we just adding another variable, like, into a contextual band that's tracking how many times they've received this message? Is it just a variable that's like the, day, the, the number of days they've been getting it so far, from 1 to 100? Do we need to formulate it more like an MVP and have some kind of state variable to capture whether they're fed up or not? Whether they're receptive or not? These are the kind of challenges that we face. And I think this is definitely something that empirically happens a lot. So that's a good thing you're planning. Thank you. Okay, great. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much again, Joseph. I'm almost happy to talk about it.